And we're live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's Inside.net. My name is Cecil Phillip. And today, you know, it's always a good time when Brandon comes around. So I'm, I'm always super happy when Brandon is here because, one, he brings the energy and he also brings like a wealth of knowledge from his experience in industry. Um, but for folks, if you do not know who Brandon is, Brandon, why don't you take, I don't know, two or three minutes real quick and just let folks know who you are and what you do. Yeah, thanks so much, Cecil. Thanks for having me back. Uh, I, I was on the show, gosh, what, a couple months ago? I think mm -hmm. we were uh, chatting about, what were we talking about, .NET, Maui stuff. But um, yeah, yeah uh, my name is Brandon Minnick. I am a developer advocate at AWS. I've been doing .NET exclusively for basically the past decade. Uh, I actually worked at a company called Xamarin that allows you to make iOS and Android apps for, uh, well, iOS and Android apps in C Sharp. Then Microsoft acquired them, which is where I got to meet and work with Cecil for, gosh, what, like seven years, five, five <laughs> years <laughs> for great time. Uh, and yeah, recently jumped over to uh, AWS. So we're, we're trying to build more awareness around .NET on AWS. I even got my cool developer relations swag nice, on. That's, that's me in the hat. So that's why I got the hat on. Is that you? Brand. Is that you on <laughs> your, you have your own clothes? Is that what's happening right now? Isn't that cool? Um, that is awesome. They made these for us. Yeah. Like it was cool. When I joined, they asked for like a bunch of pictures of me. I mean, I knew it was for this, but <laughs> yeah. like, so I was like, yeah. And I sent some of like, uh, like the professional photos of me on stage at like speaking at events and they're like, actually, um, can we just get like random photos of you? Like from the side, from the front mm -hmm. <laughs> and and then, yeah, a couple months later, this showed up in the mail, and it's it's pretty cool. You know, it's that's awesome. Eight bit really? avatar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty dope. Okay, nice. But uh, but yeah, we're doing a big push at AWS to um for .NET because AWS has always uh, or .NET has always worked on AWS since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, I, I meet people still today that I'll mention. Yeah, I'm, I I do .NET for AWS, and they're like, oh. .NET runs on AWS? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It ran on AWS before before Azure was even around. <laughs> but yeah. I get it. You know, we both came from Microsoft. It's it's a very Azure's a very easy default. And so we've got a we've got a big hill to climb because it, Microsoft makes it super easy to put everything up on Azure, which is great. I mean, find the find the solution that works for you, that's the easiest for you, that's the most cost effective for you. Um, but at the same time, We've got to up our game. So I've been working on um, improving our docs. Like our, our docs have a lot of Python examples, which who wants who wants to see Python examples, right? So I'm like, <laughs> hey guys, we need to do better. We need to have C sharp right. examples in here. And, there you go. Uh, and you know, maybe even like some that. F sharp examples sometime in the future. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, and like there's this cool thing called Visual Studio Toolkit. Uh, the, well, the AWS Toolkit for Visual Studio, which mm -hmm. uh, again blows my mind that people don't know about that. Because mm -hmm. you can interact with all your stuff in the cloud right from Visual Studio. You don't have to leave that EE. You can right, right click, public, right click, publish. Even though you're not supposed to, but yeah, I do it. <laughs> Everybody does. Like it. you can Everybody. do your logs. It's it's really cool. So um, yeah, this is literally just working with the toolkit team yesterday about you know how can mm -hmm. we make some more videos and show people how to use this and the power behind this because uh, for some reason developers aren't using it so it's 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 a great tool so it's got to be just folks don't know about it but that's me <laughs> thanks for having me back cecil oh man you know <laughs> like just listening to your listening to like that that your little bit of story you told it's such it's such an amazing thing to be for me like a dotnet advocate right and i think and just to give like a little bit of a history a little bit of history not too much like i remember when i first started dotnet and people are always just like Oh, you gotta learn multiple languages. If you're you're not a real programmer unless you do like three, four, five languages, right? And you know, later on in my career, it's like, oh, okay, no one uses .NET. Like, get off of that stuff. Da 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 da. And here I am now, almost like 15 years, 15 plus years in my career, and you know, .NET .NET runs everywhere. Like you said, like it runs on AWS, it runs on phones. I know Brandon, you're a big mobile guy, right? Like, and so you've you've written .NET applications that have run on more devices than just a website, right? Like it's not just oh, yeah. about it's not just about ASP.NET, right? Like there's so many other places that it could go. And so for me, .NET has always just been um, 
is really just always given me choice, right? Like from the beginning, I've had the choice to build the type of apps I want to build, run where I want it to run. And it's still doing that today, right? And so that's that's one of the things that I guess keeps me like super excited about like being in this space, right? Um, yeah. Because the skills that I know, I can just I just keep getting more stuff and I haven't had to do anything different really, right? Like they just keep right. adding stuff to it. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's so cool because the the C Sharp team at Microsoft really does an amazing job. Same with the .NET runtime team. Um, everybody that's working on it is so passionate about it, and they just want to continue improving it. So mm -hmm. you know, the runtime team with every release, like with .NET 8 coming out, your app running in .NET 8 is going to be faster than the same code you wrote running in .NET 7. You get performance improvements for free. Um, the C Sharp team keeps coming out with syntax improvements to make our life easier. Uh, and it's... It's just gotten to the point where it's like I I don't ever plan on leaving C sharp. Yeah. I don't ever plan on leaving .NET because, like you said, I can I can do everything. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe you know, there's the big craze nowadays around um, large language models and AI ML. And sure, would I do that in .NET? Uh, probably not. I'd probably go use the tools the big boys are using, like R and Python. But or you could just but you make could. an API yeah. call, right? You just <laughs> have someone true. else do it and just call an API. Right. But you know, like I'm a mobile app developer. Like I said, like I've got I've yeah. got a couple apps in the app store. I love making mobile apps. Like, I don't have any plans to pivot to making large language models anytime soon. So yeah, yeah like my code, when I integrate these these models is just gonna be exactly that, an API call to a chat GPT to get the results back and then we're off and running. So yeah, I figure I'll I'll let the smart people do <laughs> the AI yep. machine learning stuff and I'll just slide it into an app and then everybody thinks I'm really smart because <laughs> they can do AI in my app. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so piggybacking on that topic of us talking about .NET just being able to run in different places. Like you said, there's such a stigma of .NET is only for like Microsoft things, right? Like, so I can only run on Windows using, you know, building using Visual Studio and like publishing to Azure. Like there's that, that stigma that's there. But again, like for us that both, you know, we both used to work there and we both have built apps and we've used other things, right? Like we know that there's so much more opportunity, right? And I think that's that's the main point that I want to drive. Like there's just so much more opportunity for things that you can do, right? And particularly for folks that are running on AWS, I think it would be really interesting to kind of see how, okay, well, what are the things that we could do as .NET developers on AWS? You know, which is one of the reasons why I'm like, hey, Brian, why don't you come and talk to us about the serverless thing? Because... I know how serverless works in other places. I'd love to know how it works inside of your space, inside of AWS. Absolutely. And, you know, spoiler alert, it's really, really similar. So if you, <laughs> if you know serverless and you're familiar with that workflow, mm -hmm. it's basically the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah obviously, the, the interface is going to be a little different and, you know, the, the code you write will be a little different, but um, there's... We'll, we'll save it for the show, but yeah, there's even some cool things you can do on AWS that I was surprised that Azure doesn't offer. And folks have asked me, like, oh, why why can't you do that on Azure? And I go, oh. I don't know. I think <laughs> this is great, but okay. we'll leave that as a little tease. Stick with us. <laughs> so, and we'll, so we'll dive into it. So let's, 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 I guess let's start at the beginning, right? Like if, if I wanted to start building serverless things today on AWS, like, what do I need to know? Where do I need to go? Like, particularly as a .NET person, like, what are, what are, what are the steps like I need to take in the beginning? Yeah, so here I'll um, I'll bring up my screen because I've got I've got some slides. Um, these are actually technically these are slides that I stole. Well, that I use for uh, a couple recent conference talks, mm -hmm. uh, but they're super helpful. Um, so let's see if we can jam through them. So. Actually, real quick, Sasha, when I go full screen, I can't see you anymore, but can you see my I slides? can see the um I see the speaker view, you know what I mean? With like the notes yep. and stuff. Yeah, oh, no. there you go. So now I see All your right. slide cool. full screen. There you go. Cool. Yeah, and give me a heads up if anything goes wrong, because for some reason, yeah, the second monitor I have in front of me is just went blank. So <laughs> oh, okay. All right, no problem. We'll fly I'm blind, but um but yeah, so um this is um, all about serverless today. Um, we'll be talking about how to use AWS Lambda with C Sharp. Uh, Lambda is what we call our serverless offering. So if you've used Azure, you're probably familiar with Azure Functions. This is AWS Lambda. 
both are serverless. And what I've done is I've put a little uh, web page together for us. So on the bottom right, you see there's that QR code there. That'll take you to this link, codetraveler.io slash .net dash serverless, where you can find the uh, you can find the slides there. You can find uh, recording. Like I mentioned earlier, I gave this talk at uh, NDC, the Norwegian Developers Conference in Oslo in London, and they record the session. So I got a little free recording out of that that you can check out. So if you have any uh, friends, you can forward that on to if you want. And we'll show off some uh, code samples today too that I've also um, open sourced. They're on GitHub and linked to on that website. But... Uh, I think with serverless, we, we should go all the way back and just say, like, what what is serverless? Because it's it's kind of this funny buzzword. And, you know, it really took off, gosh, five to six, seven years yeah. ago. Yeah, I want to say from five years ago. Like, five, six years yeah, ago. Like, like everybody was going to serverless. Um, but if you think about it, it doesn't really make sense because serverless mean, kind of implies that there's no servers, which is kind of the idea behind serverless, but you know, from just a real world physics standpoint, like your, your code's got to run on a server. Like code just yeah. can't run without a CPU, without memory, or at least we haven't figured out a way to do that <laughs> yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the better way to think of it is just, there's less server. So there's, there's less server to manage. Uh, there's less server to pay for, which is great. One of my favorite things about serverless is just, it's mm -hmm. so cheap. Like, I use it for my mobile apps that are in the app store because my apps are free. I don't make any money off them. It's just passion projects that I right. do on the nights and weekends and every mobile app needs a backend. And if I had paid to spin up a virtual machine or something like that running in the cloud, it would totally work, but I'd be out hundreds of dollars every month because cloud costs expensive. money. They've, they've yeah. got to pay for their servers. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, with serverless, it's a super cheap option that I can use to keep my app free. And it's also great because you don't have to manage as much on the server side. And if we go way back, like before serverless existed, uh, everything was on-prem. This is how it was when I started my career. And, you know, I'm, I'm 36. I don't think I'm that old. Although, <laughs> I, I don't, did you see that tweet, man, recently? Somebody was like, Which developers, one? 35 and older, what are you up to? And I was like, wait, hold up. <laughs> No, I didn't see it. Now I gotta go look for that. <laughs> yeah, I think even um, oh gosh, what's his name? Um, the guy who created uh, .NET Core at Microsoft. Um, Fowler. Say that one more time. Was it Fowler? They look, they Fowler, David Fowler. Yeah, uh, he retweeted it. He's like, "What? Thirty <laughs> five? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, like so. I started back in uh, 2009, 2010, and the company I worked at, like everything was on-prem. We had a giant data center uh, that I basically lived in uh, because you had to go there all the time to literally install your servers. And like, if I wanted to write a new app, well, the first thing we had to talk about was, okay, what server do we need for its backend? You know, what kind of scale are we expecting? Um, how do we handle redundancy? So we always get two servers and then there's questions about like, how do you handle, like this was in Florida. <laughs> it's like, well, if a hurricane hits our data center here in Melbourne, Florida, what do we do? It's like, okay, well, you're right. So we should probably get a third server and ship that up to the data center in Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you have all this extra overhead when really all we're doing is making an app. And so uh, what, what you end up doing is you have to plan months in advance because just to order the server is going to take yeah. four to six weeks lead time. And that's optimistic, assuming your company's got like, um, uh, what do they call Like accounts receivable and payable sure. and yeah. able to do POs relatively quickly. So anyways, yeah, on-premises was a pain. I mean, I would literally... Like once we figured out what server we needed, then we had to wait a couple months. The server would come in, it'd land on my desk. I'd have to walk that server down to the data center, find an open rack, slide it in, um, bolt it on there, hook up all the cables, hook up power, hook up ethernet. And then finally, you're just able to turn it on. But yeah. Then you have to install the operating system and you have to install all the security patches. And it's, it's a pain. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's especially for us software folks, like we just want to write code, but yeah. let me jump through all these hoops. And 
then from the company standpoint, you have all this overhead that you have to have capital for too. So you have to have the overhead to pay for this giant data center. You have to have physical security at the data center. So you, only people with the right badge access to get in. And yeah. you have to have like network admins that make sure nobody hacks in. You have to have um, system admins who make sure everything's patched and there's no security holes uh, running on the server. So it's crazy. So on premise, I'm glad that's not really the, the way to do things anymore. And it all kind of started with, AWS, like Amazon basically looked around and said, well, we have all these servers that we're using for our website, amazon.com, if you've never heard of it. <laughs> uh, and it's like, but these servers aren't running at 100% capacity, you know, and you do that on purpose, right? Like you, you want to have some overhead, but as engineers, we always, 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 or at least I <laughs> always, always vastly overestimate what I'll need. So like most of my servers, back when I was doing on-prem stuff, we're running like between one and 10%. So we greatly over-engineered them. And so I assume that was probably something similar going on at Amazon. And they kind of looked around and said, well, what if we let people rent time on our servers? Because there's this relatively new concept called virtual machines, where it allows you to chop up a server into multiple servers, basically. So you could say, I'm going to dedicate two CPUs and eight gigs of RAM from the server to run this Windows operating system. And I'm going to dedicate four CPUs from the same server and this much RAM to run a Linux operating system. And for all intents and purposes, they're totally different servers, even though they're running on the same physical hardware. Uh, and that was all thanks to virtual machines. So yeah. yeah, this concept of cloud infrastructure came about where now we didn't have to worry about buying servers because... We want to make an app. Well, I can just, with a couple of clicks of the mouse, go to AWS and say, hey, give me a virtual machine. I need five cores. Well, probably has to be an even number. Four cores, <laughs> 68 gigs of, 64 gigs of RAM. Uh, and in a couple seconds, maybe minutes, uh, it'd, be, it'd be ready for me to use. Um, and that was great because we didn't have the whole data center concern anymore. We don't uh, need to have racks and servers. We don't have to worry about heating and cooling costs. But, you know, we're still just running a server. So that server still needs network admins for security. We still need system admins also for security to keep the operating system patched and up to date. Uh, we still had to handle our own routing uh, and all that fun yeah. stuff. Um, so a little while after that came this concept of, well, what if we had these platforms running on the cloud, which made it even better for us. Well, us, us developers, <laughs> where um, with these cloud platforms, they said, okay, you know, we'll take care of all the server stuff. Like, obviously you're a developer, you don't care about servers. Like, um, you don't wanna know, you don't really care what version of Linux are you writing? Like, what if we manage the operating system for you? And then you tell us how much server you need. Like, I'll still tell you, I need uh, an eight core CPU with 64 gigs of RAM. Um, but then I don't have to worry about windows or Linux or security patches. I don't have to worry about networking, all that stuff's taken care of for me. And that was great. Love that. Cause now I can just, like we were talking about earlier, I can just right click, publish my code to the cloud and it'll be and running. Somebody else will just figure that stuff out for me. Yeah. Like, Fantastic. yeah, I'm not an expert in that stuff, but somebody else is and mm. they can do it for me. So teamwork. Um, you know, this that reminds me of, I want to like really quick story. Yeah. Like my first job out of college, <clears throat> I remember, so all the apps used to run for, for .NET folks that might remember what IIS is. <laughs> that, that's, that's like how you date .NET folks if you, <laughs> they can tell you what IIS is. I got chills when you said that. Yeah. IIS. Oh, what PTSD. Is that? <laughs> um, but like, so we used to run our apps inside of IIS, right? And without going into the details of it. So if I wanted to test my application, like outside of my machine, I had to get a, a VM provision, provision. It took me two weeks to get a VM set up, right? Not, not because of me, but because I had to put in a request and then licensing had to get involved because, you know, Windows licenses cost money. And yeah. then they had to like spin it up on the machine and then they had to network and then security patches and all this other stuff. And I'm just talking about testing. That's all we talk about. We're just talking <laughs> about testing. You know what I mean? Not deploying or all that other stuff, which is why... Like I'm a huge fan of like cloud infrastructure, right? Because I can just go in, I can click a button, 
put in or maybe not even put in a credit card, get a free trial, and then I could just run some stuff. And it, I can probably do that within like, I don't know, a couple of hours, right? Versus like two or three weeks of just waiting to get, you know, resources. Oh, yeah. And, and also with the shortened time period, time window, um, it's also like one person can do it. Like yeah. for, for my mobile apps, like I'm the only developer working on them. I mean, they're open source and people are welcome to contribute. Uh, but it's just me at the end of the day. And uh, like I'm a mobile app developer. I don't really know anything about well i used to know things about servers but <laughs> that was 10 years ago i'm sure everything's different uh and so yeah just being able to ignore that and focus on my code and to be able to do it easily and quickly so and really what what we're seeing now is they're for probably 90 maybe even up to like 98 percent of companies like there's no reason why you shouldn't use cloud. Um, and I know yeah. you'll probably see comments and there's a million reasons why they'll say that they shouldn't because they're unique, but you can always work around that. Yeah. Um, but really, uh, until you get to a certain size, um, cloud's even cheaper than doing everything on-prem. And it's not until like, like I, think, I think it was Dropbox that pulled off the cloud and they are reverting back to data centers. And that's just because when you... When you get a certain size, then you're almost like your own cloud. <laughs> and so there's some economies of scale to it, which is how companies like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud um, are able to operate on it and not go out of business with the costs. But uh, yeah, for most of us, just use the cloud. Uh, like you're going to kill yourself doing all this stuff on-prem um, and burning through all your engineering hours and time and just life's going to be easier. <laughs> no, so, it will be. Big fan of the like, cloud. I know I'm heavily biased working for two cloud companies, but big fan of the cloud. So, no, but I think it just makes sense. And for me, one of, one of the things that you learn as like a person that spends time in software is like everything is about the right level of abstraction, right? And kind of like what you were showing. Okay, well, hey, I can have the machine, I can put the machine onto my desk, I can set up myself. But like, do I need like that level of detail? And you know what? Some people might need that, right? And some people don't. It just just is what it is. I I don't run hardware companies. I I never need to like optimize storage <laughs> ops to like yeah I don't know the megabytes per second. Like I'm not like I'm not optimizing software on that level. But some people do, right? And like for those people, I can totally understand why like the cloud is not the right level of abstraction for them, right? It's way too high. Like they need they need to be down to the wire. Whereas, again, like I'm building web apps and web APIs, right? <laughs> like backend services. I'm probably never going to need to know even what type of hard drive that I'm using. Like, I don't care, right? Like, <laughs> is, there, is it there? And does yeah. it have space? Yeah, sure. Okay. I don't need to know anything else, right? Let, let, let's go. You know what I mean? Right. Like, we're just hosting a website or we're just making a backend for a mobile app. Like, let's not overthink it. So, so right. So, we're at this point now with these platforms in the cloud where... Um, we don't have to worry about the servers anymore. We just tell it, I want eight CPUs and 64 gigs of RAM. Here's my code. It just runs. Like AWS gives me the URL for the website. AWS handles all the networking, all the security. They're going to update the operating systems, keep them patched. And they've got an army of security engineers to make sure that nobody breaks in and hacks AWS. Um, and this is great. And this is still a valid way of doing things. And for many applications, it is the way you should be doing things. Like, and this is what we call Elastic Beanstalk is the name of this service uh, we have in AWS. Um, but what if we took it a step further? Well, if we go one step further, we'll get to serverless where now I don't even tell AWS how much server I need. I don't even specify that I need eight core CPU with 64 gigs of RAM. Instead, I just say, hey, AWS, here's my code. Anytime it needs to run, run it. And then AWS will scale it up. So like, if I have uh, 100,000 users open my app all at the same time, it'll scale up to handle that. Yeah. And on the flip side, if maybe all of my users are in the US and it's the middle of the night, they're all asleep and nobody's using it, it'll scale down the servers all the way to zero. Um, and what's great about that is now I'm not being charged for 
compute time, networking costs that I'm not right. using because with the platform, I, I still was reserving a certain amount of CPU, a certain amount of RAM, and that was mine. Nobody else could use that. And so whether or not my users were consuming those resources, I would still get billed every month for that. So almost like this fixed cost for yeah. reserving that server space plus whatever, you know, consumption that my users drew from the server. So like you still get billed for your CPU time, you still get billed for your networking throughput. Um, but with serverless, I don't have that, have to worry about that fixed cost anymore. And this is really where things get super, super cheap. Um, and to me, this is, this is kind of like the same model that was dreamed up when the cloud was first created. Cause this is basically like, Hey, we've got extra space on the servers. So what if we are able to abstract all this serverless, this concept of servers away from the developers? Well, then we can just find an open server, run that code on it. It's not going to run very long and we can spin it back down to zero. And from an optimization standpoint for data centers, like now they're, <laughs> they're taking advantage of all the horsepower they have. And then for us as developers, we get a super cheap monthly bill. So it's, it's really, really great. Um, like I said, I, I use it for my mobile apps. Um, but what, we, what we're looking at is we're abstracting away the servers. We're instantly publishing our code to the cloud. We don't need to manage operating systems. We don't need to manage networking. We have scale. We can scale all the way up to meet our millions of users. And, and you can put a cap on that, by the way. If, if you're worried about getting a huge bill, you can tell it limits on how how much to scale so you don't get surprised with a giant bill because maybe your app goes viral and millions of users download it although if my app went viral and millions of users download it i'd call that a win <laughs> but yeah. uh but yeah instant scale all the way up and it'll scale down to zero when everything's idle but here's the catch um because it dun, dun, scales dun. down to zero mm -hmm. yeah you get this concept of cold starts yeah and a cold start is the f first time your app runs, then you know, AWS has to find the resources. It's got to take your code. It's got to run it on a server. And it's basically like, like when we say .NET run in the command line or in Visual Studio and we click play, like that's basically happening behind the scenes along with allocating space on a server. And that takes time again. Physics, we're, we're working in the bounds of the laws of physics, uh, and that takes a little bit of time. And so what you'll see is what we call it a, we call it a cold start penalty. Uh, and on AWS with .NET 6, .NET 7, uh, we're getting really close to it almost being negligible now. Mm -hmm. um, so if, you, if you're still running .NET 6, and you can see here on ARM, it's going to take about a second. Um, and so... When the first user launches my app, they'll see about a s second before they get the first response back. But after that, the server's warmed up and it stays warm for a certain amount of time. I think it's about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so the second request they make to my serverless backend will only take five, 10, 20 milliseconds at the worst, which is, I mean, that's, yeah. that's negligible. That's, <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even include that in, um, in my timings because what is 20 milliseconds? Um, yeah. And what's really cool, so obviously this cold start time is something we want to get rid of. If, if, we can make, if we can make serverless apps launch instantly, then I think it really makes the choice easier because you know, I think between this and we were talking about with Elastic Beanstalk, the platform service, um, you know, Elastic Beanstalk is going to be running 24 seven, but you also have to pay for that because you're reserving the CPU, you're reserving the RAM just for your app and whether or not anybody's using it, it's gonna be up and running. Um, so with serverless times, with these cold start times getting down to 500, 300 milliseconds, um, now we're getting into the realm of probably 95, 98% of apps could use serverless because when we think about it, 300 milliseconds, that's literally how long it takes to blink your eyes. So in a blink of an eye, your app will be up and running. It'll go from zero to running <laughs> on AWS yeah. Lambda. And just 
300 milliseconds really matter? Like if a user blinks once and then the app's launched, they probably won't notice. And as I'll tell you, they, they won't notice. So for most, most apps, we're getting to a point where this cold start penalty uh, is really becoming negligible. And it's, you know, it's a continued focus with the Lambda team. Um, they're hyper aware of cold start times and any Im any code changes they make to Lambda um, or updates they add to it, they're always going to make sure the cold start times go down. And so couple that with there's this cool thing called AOT, native AOT that was included in .NET 7. And mm -hmm. I think it was included as more of like a preview thing. Like I, I personally wouldn't run my apps using native AOT because uh, you would have to do extensive, extensive testing to make sure that everything works. But with .NET yeah. 8 coming out, Microsoft's put even more work into native AOT. And I think with .NET 8, they're starting to say like, yeah, this is this is ready for prime time. And yeah. you can, and you should publish your apps to the cloud um, with AOT, which stands for ahead of time compiled. And so what that means is like, yes, your C-sharp code is compiled normally with your .NET apps, but the .NET runtime isn't. And there's a lot of code that gets, it's called just in time compiled, JIT compiled, J-I-T. Um, and so there's a little bit of a, a penalty there because with just in time compiling, you now have to load all those resources up into memory and you have to run them when the app launches every time. Like you've got to basically run .NET and run your app with, yeah. but with ahead of time compiling, everything's compiled ahead of times ahead of time. So you get this huge performance boost on startup times, which, you know, if you're running a website that's running 24 seven, do you really care about startup time? Probably not because you're only running it once. But yeah. when we introduce this concept of serverless that are constantly spinning up, spinning down, well, now this is a big deal. And, you know, I expect to see these numbers dropping, you know, .NET 8 still in preview and we've got some uh, metrics for it, which you can actually, I've posted the link to where you can find this table um, on our AWS GitHub on my codetraveler.io slash .NET dash serverless site. And so you can see some numbers flowing in, start to flow in from .NET 8. Uh, if you don't know James Easton, highly recommend uh, following James Easton. I think his Twitter is plant powered James. Uh, he's, <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> he's kind of leading the .NET serverless charge um, at, at AWS or, or Norm, um, is it Norm Johnson? The, mm -hmm. he's the lead engineer on it. Anyways, devoting a lot of engineering time to reduce cold starts. And we're getting to this world where probably, you know, I can only really think of something like, like if you're a FinTech app that is making trades on Wall Street, and if you wait 300 milliseconds, well, the stock price might've gone up by two basis points and that would nullify the trade and your company would lose billions. Then yeah, serverless probably still isn't for you. But I think for the rest of us <laughs> that don't need to have instantaneous stuff done um, in the cloud, 300 milliseconds is nothing. I, I personally don't care about 300 milliseconds. So keep yeah. this in mind. Um, yeah. This is still very much a real thing. Um, and this should be one of those determining factors when you're building your apps. Like, can we get away with um, a couple hundred milliseconds of cold start delay? And I'll tell you what, man, like if you, if you launch any of my apps from the app store, um, you'll see I have this animated splash screen mm -hmm. and it looks cool. It's really pretty. Well, I'm biased. I, I think it looks cool and it's really <laughs> pretty. Um, but really what that's doing is that's just distracting the user. So they see this fun animation and then, oh, oh, dang, the animation's done. Okay, the app's loaded. And I do that because I'm running serverless on the back end and I want to distract their attention. So it doesn't feel like my app is taking an extra second to load. Yeah. And that was actually a, a fun thing I learned in psychology class way back in the day where there was this, um, I think it was in Chicago, like somewhere with really big buildings and mm. people would have to take the elevator up to the office and everybody was complaining that, you know, the elevators take forever. And, you know, with elevators, you can't really make them faster because you safety first, like yeah. <laughs> step one, don't kill anybody. <laughs> step two, make them as efficient as possible. Yeah. Uh, but step one, <laughs> like, or priority one is don't kill yeah. people. Um, so people are complaining and the building's like, well, there's nothing really we can do about it. You can't just like turn up the speed on an elevator. Um, and so what they ended up doing, they just installed mirrors in the lobby. 
And mm. all of a sudden, everybody stopped complaining. And it wasn't because the elevators got faster, but it's because when people showed up for work in the morning, you know, they're like adjusting their tie, they make sure yeah. their hair looks good from the commute. Oh, and then the elevator's here. So it mm. felt like <laughs> the elevator arrived faster. And these are the tricks that I use um, so that my users don't notice this cold start delay. And, and again, once that server's already warmed up, everything's business as usual. Right, um, and it's ready but, to go. Yeah. yeah, keep that in mind. So can you get away with a couple hundred milliseconds of delay? Um, are there things you can do to distract the user? Is it gonna impact the business? I think for most, most use cases, probably not. And if you can get away with that, then what you end up with is what we call this micro billing. Um, so these are, these are real numbers. I pulled these from, these are the two app store apps that I've published. Um, there's shameless plug, Git Trends. So if you're a GitHub user and you have a bunch of repos like I do, like I've got a couple hundred open source repos on GitHub. Mm -hmm. um, I, I created Git Trends so that I can monitor my repos. I can, so Git Trends will show you all the trends around your repos, like how many users are viewing your code, um, how many users are cloning your code, how many stars your repos get, and it'll give you graphs to see that over time. And I think, well, the killer feature for me, and again, I made this selfishly for me, uh, was that if one of my repos get a spike, like if um, somebody mentions it in a blog post or on a live stream like this, and all of a sudden, you know, a thousand people go to my GitHub repo and look up Git Trends, then you'll get this spike in users. And so what Git Trends will do is send you a push notification to say, hey, this repo is trending. And then you can jump in and you can also see where the traffic's coming from. So you can kind of figure yeah. out what's going on. And um, really for me, it's make sure the code's up to date, make sure the code still works. Because <laughs> you know, there's some repos I haven't touched in a couple of years and all of a sudden like <laughs> they get a couple hundred users looking at it. I'm like, ah, let me jump in and fix that. So. So yeah. let's get trends. Um, Punday is a is a fun game. Um, I teamed up with a, uh, my buddy Matthew Broussard. He's a stand up comedian that makes these funny mm. drawings, and each drawing is a pun. Mm. And so you have to figure out just by looking at the drawing what what's the pun. So it's a fun word game if you're into word games and puns. But what we're talking about is serverless, and these are the actual costs um, for my app. So you know I don't have million users, but you can start to see a scale for how much I'm paying for a couple hundred monthly active users, 14 cents and 19 cents. So 14 US pennies for my Git Trends backend. I could absolutely afford that. I mean, it's, like I said, it's a free app. I don't make any money off it. And with serverless, I can keep the cost super low. And I've got, I've got it written down here. I don't, this doesn't really mean much to me because the scale, but yeah. If you're curious, it's point zero 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 one three 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 three, repeating U.S. dollars per gigabit second, uh, which is, I don't know, man, incomprehensibly small to me. <laughs> yeah, it's not even like any. Once you're talking about like less than less than like a cent, then I mean, we don't even need to talk about it. You know, <laughs> it's, it's so it's so tiny. Yeah, like I look at that and go, oh, so it's free. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll send a couple pennies in the mail every month to you, AWS. Great. Yeah. And so to me, this is the biggest benefit of serverless, um, along with the fact that I don't have to manage an operating system and all those benefits that come with running on the cloud mm -hmm. is this this bill is super, super affordable. And for free apps, yeah, I'll, I'll donate a couple pennies every month. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's not going to kill me. Um. And so I think this, well, I think I just said microbilling was the killer feature, but I'm also going to say event-driven is the other killer feature. <laughs> so two killer features of serverless um, because, so because the, the serverless instance gets scaled all the way down to zero, something has to trigger it. Something has to wake it up. And we've kind of been talking about, without really saying it, like APIs. So like an HTTP request gets made to the server that's running on AWS Lambda, a serverless instance, then that HTTP trigger is what will wake it up. But what's really cool is you can have all these other services that already run on AWS trigger <laughs> your, your serverless instance to wake it up. So for example, uh, what we're going to see today, I have a, an S3 trigger, which S3 is just storage on AWS. Like You can think of it as like a folder in the cloud where you can dump anything you want in it. You can put in text files, you can put in images. It's kind of like 
having a folder on your desktop where you can drop in your vacation photos. That's, mm-hmm. that's S3. Um, and so you can have, you can configure your serverless instance to any time a new file is added to this S3 bucket, wake up and run some code. And what we'll see today is uh, we're going to be uploading images. And I'll have, I have an S3 trigger that takes that image and scales it down to a thumbnail. Uh, but if you had, you can, if you had a DynamoDB database, so like maybe a new user signs up for your app, you store that user info in DynamoDB, you can have a database trigger wake up your serverless code and run that specific to that new database entry. So things like, you know, I signed up for a service, we could have a DynamoDB trigger wake up and send me, the new user, a welcome email. And that way you don't have to have this like inline flow. Everything can just happen based off of events. And we don't have to have like, you know, in a monolith, it'd just be a lot of async and await, right? It'd be like, okay, well, yeah. await, adding this user to the database, awaiting. await, yeah. sending an email, and you're just chewing up resources because that app's got to keep running while it's awaiting. <laughs> but here, we can just have things trigger. So anytime anything new is added to the database, or if you can add something to queues, you can queue objects up in the cloud, um, or streaming data with AWS Kinesis. And... There's there's a bunch more, but <laughs> we're already we're already running a little low on time. So let's actually jump into the code and look at this, um, because, like I mentioned, I'm a mobile app developer. Mm. So I made us a little mobile app today using uh, .NET Maui. So it's all in C sharp, and what I've created is this super super common use case where um, you may not realize it, but anytime you upload a photo to I'll say any app, but let's say Instagram. Um, Instagram doesn't serve that same photo to all your friends. Uh, when they see it on their timeline, what Instagram's done is they've scaled down that photo because, you know, if you think about it, like the new iPhone has like a 48 megapixel camera. And so you're giving Instagram a 48 megapixel photo, which I don't, I don't even know how big that is, but hundreds of megs, maybe even bigger if depending on the format, (laughs) um, and it'd be crazy for Instagram to serve that same photo to all of your friends because they'd launch the app and they'd have to wait for a hundred megabyte photo to load. And what are they going to do? They're going to blame Instagram. They're going to say the app is slow yeah. and they're going to give it a one star review. So what what every app does, or at least should do <laughs> when a user uploads an image is scale it down because you don't need to be feeding 48 megapixel photos because you know the screens on your your mobile devices aren't that big. And right. so like Instagram, they optimize for screen size. So they'll detect what screen size you're using. And if it's a smaller screen, they'll send a smaller photo. If it's a bigger screen, they'll send a bigger photo. And that also saves them on their networking costs and, and stuff like that. So let's jump into the code because what we're going to do, I've built three serverless Lambda instances. One is an HTTP trigger that is basically just a post request. I just post the image. I upload the image to the server. And all that serverless Lambda is doing is just dumping that image into my S3 bucket. Then I have an S3 trigger that anytime a new file is added to that bucket, it wakes up and it runs. And in this case, it'll be generating a thumbnail. And then the mobile app, when it consumes the images, I have this get thumbnail, which is, again, just like it's a REST API. It's a get API that is just running in a serverless instance that will retrieve the thumbnail for the photo instead of that same huge, (laughs) uh, we'll say 48 megapixel image that you might've uploaded. So let me show you, I'll just, I'll just run the app for you first. Um, so here is, here's the app. Um, right now I'm running on Mac OS. So if you, if you decide to try out.net Maui, I'm, I'm super biased because I used to work at Xamarin. Like I mentioned earlier, Microsoft acquired Xamarin and basically rebranded it into.net Maui. So I've, I've got a, a long history and a lot of love <laughs> here uh, yes, coming from the Xamarin world. Um, but what's really cool about Maui is it lets you run your app on iOS, Android, uh, Windows desktop, and macOS desktop. So the same code we're seeing here running on macOS desktop, I could and can also run it from my iOS device or my Android device. So so let's, let's run through this real quick because it's a really simple app. It's just going to take our picture so let's go ahead and grant it access, access the camera. There's me. Beautiful picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And so what's happening now is it's sending that code up to the cloud. So it's that post API, that post API is dumping it into my S3 bucket. The S3 trigger is waking up my serverless Lambda to uh, generate the thumbnail. And then that thumbnail comes back and you can see it's, it's much, much smaller. Like this is a little blurrier. Uh, this is actually yeah. 200 by 200 pixels is the kind of arbitrary number I chose for this. Mm -hmm. And all of this is just happening automatically. Everything's just triggered because um, when we build our serverless backend, that's how we want to think of things. Like serverless instances, they only stay alive for a couple minutes. Um, they're not meant to be running forever. And I know like Lambda will actually stop <laughs> your serverless instance if it's running too long. Mm -hmm. Um, I forget how long that time is, if it's 5, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. But um, but if we look at the code for this backend, um, well, one cool thing is this is all in .NET. It's all written in C Sharp. So I have the same code for um, my mobile app in the same solution as my backend. And because it's all in C Sharp, I can share some code in between them so I don't have to duplicate stuff. Um, but let's check out... Let's do the get API. So this is probably one of the most common use cases for, for serverless is let's create a get API. And so really what we're doing is we're just creating a method. So I have this method called function handler that in this case, let's make this a little bigger, has a response or a trigger. And in this case, that trigger is a, an HTTP request. So this HTTP request comes in via Azure's API gateway to wake it up. And we this request is, you know, this is just your HTTP request. So we can, what I do is I check the query parameters because uh, the mobile app tells you what the name of the file is that it needs. And if obviously that's not there, I send back a, a response that says bad request. Like, you got to tell me what file you need. I'm not just going to give you a random file. Um, but from there, all I do is I get the thumbnail file name because the, the mobile phone doesn't know that I generated the thumbnail. It just knows the original file that it gave me and it's asking for that back. So I have, I generate that file name and it's, this is really simple code. I just add in this constant that underscore thumbnail dot PNG. <laughs> so yeah. I just rename it underscore thumbnail. And then once I have that, because that lives in S3, um, Amazon, AWS, really smart. They thought ahead. They said, we don't want anybody just to have access to your entire S3 bucket. That'd be a huge security hole. Um, so, so what they do is uh, you're able to generate a, a short-lived URL. So, so I have this file that I made called S3 service, where I've got a couple static methods in here that feel free to, to grab these, copy, paste these into your code. But really all we're doing is, well, First of all, we have this S3 client that up here, um, when this app launches, when the service instance launches, it creates this new Amazon S3 client. And what's really cool about this is because this is initialized, because it's newed up in the code running in the cloud, this client has all the info that we don't want to share elsewhere, like all the security info, like right. it knows how to access my S3 instance. It's got all the credentials built in because this is running in like my little secure enclave in the cloud. And um, it knows how to access everything that I have access to or have granted access to it. And so what we're doing is we're just passing in that S3 client along with my S3 bucket name and the thumbnail that I want to get. And if we check out this code here, all I'm doing is looking to make sure that does the file exist? <laughs> um, so we're just looking to get the object from that S3 bucket. And if the response is null, then obviously it doesn't exist. But for our app, this demo, obviously it did. And what we're doing is we're going to set an expiration date. So again, Instagram, it's really cool. If, if you ever go to the Instagram website, you can always um, dig into the source code. So, you know, as developers, we can right click and say, um, you know, view source code. And you'll see in Instagram, you know, you gotta dig a little bit for it, but eventually you'll find a URL that is what they're serving to us, but that URL has this time window on it. So we've set this expiration date. And for this demo app, I set it to a year. I think Instagram sets it to a minute or a couple minutes. So 
you can't uh-huh. come back and see that uh, access that same file again. Yeah. But, but yeah, so what we do, we generate this pre-signed URL for the bucket I specified, the uh, key, which is the file name, and then my expiration date, and then that's it. So I, I've got this URL back, and what this API is doing is just returning that thumbnail URL back so that now the mobile phone can display it. And, and so this is really cool because this is just one function. We've got a couple lines of code, 50 lines of code here, 20 lines of code in my S3 service. And we're able to access this file from my backend API. And this is all running serverlessly. So it spins up, it spins back down when nobody's using it. And your monthly bill is basically negligible because of that. And as long as you're cool with a little bit of the cold start time or you can work around it or as .NET 8, .NET 9 comes out and those cold start times get lower and lower, um, keep an eye on those because eventually those will just become negligible. And we can actually see that here because when I first ran it, you know, it took a couple seconds, not too long, but if we run it again, now that everything's warmed up, it should come back much faster than, than it took originally. So I didn't time the first one. <laughs> so this is very uh, unempirical, but come on, make it faster. <laughs> it's, it's coming. Don't, don't make there me a go. liar. So, well, maybe somebody can time it in the comments. Let us know how much faster that was because uh, it should be at least three seconds faster because we had three cold start penalties in there in the first one. Right. Uh, so, so this is what like an HDP uh, trigger looks like. Uh, if I dig into the code for my generate thumbnail, it's going to look really, really similar. Uh, we still have our S3 client. Uh, we still have our function handler, but the difference here is it's an S3 event that wakes it up. Um, so again, this S3 event, this includes everything about my S3 bucket. So I can immediately access my S3 bucket and I can uh, check to see like this is the bucket's name and again, the key, which is just the file name. Uh, but let me see, we're running real short on time. So let me show you what this looks like in AWS. So this is the AWS web console. And in here, I've got my serverless functions. Let's jump over to the data center where they exist. There we go. Um, so, you know, my generate thumbnail needs an S3 trigger. And this is where we wire that up. So once we have written our code, we come in here and we just say add trigger to tell it that here's, here's how we want to wake you up. And like I said, there's, there's tons of ways to trigger serverless functions, even from uh, partners outside of AWS, which is really, really cool. Um, so you just point it to the S3 bucket in this instance that I want to wake it up. And AWS basically handles the rest. So I get this S3 event that comes in and I can just, basically ignore all this stuff on the back end as a developer. Um, and likewise with the those get APIs, similar, I wire it up to an API gateway. So this is how it knows this is an HTTP trigger and an HTTP event is what's gonna wake it up. Whew, all right. Sorry, so, so I see we only got two minutes left. <laughs> no, that's um, fine, keep going, keep going. <laughs> um, well, that's. I think that's basically it for the demo. Um, happy to stay on with you. If you want to go over, I can dive into some more code, but I'll share the the QR code, the URL for anybody following along. If you haven't had a chance, make sure to uh, grab this link, bookmark it, save it, because uh, this is where you can find that code for this Lambda trigger sample app that we just showed off. Uh, this is where you can find links to the cold start tables and times that we keep track of for .NET or James Easton keeps track of for .NET on AWS. So all your resources from that we've covered today, you can find here, but whew, what do you think? Yeah, man. What, what questions no, I, did, I think that was pretty really cool. Um, and I definitely have a lot of other questions that I, I really kind of want to dive in a little bit deeper into. And I think what might be a good idea, maybe we could set up some future, some other future sessions with, with, with us on the show. We can kind of really dive into those because a couple of things that popped into my head was, okay, that seems really easy to do. And particularly the, looking at your code, like the code looked really easy to follow. So the first thing I'm, I want to ask as well, well, how do I debug the thing, right? Like, how do, and how do I debug it on my machine? And how do I know when bad things happen in outer space, right? Like, like after it's deployed, like how do I, how do I debug 
maybe debug is not a good word. How do I diagnose <laughs> problems? How do I diagnose problems on my machine? And how do I diagnose problems in the cloud? Like, I'd love to know that. And then yes, also, um, what's that other thing? Like, you showed how to how to add the triggers in the um, the dashboard, the console, and you want to something really stupid. Like, so I <laughs> when I tried to use AWS, I never thought about that. I was just like, oh, okay there's this cloud formation thing and i'm like sitting down trying to figure out like other other ways to do it and i'm just like oh i could have just gone like clickety click clickety click and clicked it <laughs> and i probably would have been able to create my demo so much faster again as a person that is like non aws familiar i'm like oh, okay i probably would have been able to do this faster if i just did it that way so i think in general for from probably for most .NET folks we haven't spent a lot of time exploring the, the, the console, the dashboard area. So I think kind of like looking and seeing, okay, well, how do I set up this infrastructure and how do I diagnose these problems? Um, and also connect to like these other event sources would be something I think, I think a lot of folks would be really interested to, to dive into. Yeah, we can, we can actually cue that. Yeah, we can definitely cue that up for a future episode. Um, but I will say, so there's a couple things I didn't even get a chance to touch on that well, tell I, me. I alluded to at the beginning, um, but yeah, if we bring my screen back up, so this, so now I'm now I'm on uh, Visual Studio on the PC. I've, yeah. uh, for anybody curious on your Mac, you can just You're run running parallels. Machine. Yeah, love parallels. Mm -hmm. So, running Visual Studio um, on PC because this is where we can find the. Whoa. Zoom up, zoom out. There we go. So this is the AWS toolkit for Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. um, so we get our AWS Explorer here. It's all built in, and you can see like. These are my AWS lambdas that we're just looking at. Upload image, get thumbnail, generate thumbnail, and and you can we can do things like um, like like generate thumbnail. We can we can view the logs. We can get all this in Visual Studio. Um, so you're asking like, how do we know if something blows up? Well, we can go back and look at the logs, uh, and I mean we should have reporting and stuff wired up, but you know we can see like. June 28th, here we are, uh, 956 AM. Mm -hmm. This is my local time. Um, yeah. we can see that this is where it generated the thumbnail. And, you know, if we look back at my code, um, now I have, where am I logging? Here we go. So like context.logger. And again, this I Lambda context is just given to us. Right. Um, so we just say log information, which is, you know, very, very similar to how we do it in .NET. Um, and we can say like put in errors, um, you can run these locally, like you mentioned, uh, like how do I debug it? You can run them locally. You can do it with the debugger. Um, it gets a little complicated because, you know, we talked about how when this S3 client initializes in the cloud, well, it's got all my service credentials and it knows how to access that S3 bucket that lives in the cloud. Yeah. But when I run it locally, it doesn't have all that info because it's just running on my PC, not the server yeah, it's in, a different in the space. cloud. So. Um, yeah, you'll have to know how to work around that. Like you'll have to probably generate, um, some access keys to give your code some permissions. Be careful with that. Uh, you don't want to uh, commit those to GitHub or anything like that accidentally. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, you can, you can debug them locally. Um, or if, if you want, you can always just, <laughs> you can put in logs. Um, but I prefer the debugger over logging. Um, but yeah, man. Yeah, we should definitely come back and do a do a deeper dive on all this stuff because this is this is really cool. I, I love this stuff. Um, the oh yeah. So the other thing you mentioned, like how, like how do we even create these? Um, once you add in that AWS toolkit, then it comes with a bunch of templates. So like if I oh, type nice. in Lambda, you can see I've I've already have it used for recent projects. Don't know why the search is taking so long. There they are. So you can create one for Node.js or in our case, C Sharp. And when you do that, it'll ask you like, what do you, what do you want to make? Uh, maybe. It's thinking. All right. Oh, there we go. So, there you go. So yeah, then it, uh, you can say like just an empty function or like if you want to see an example of how to use Kinesis or we're using S3 for S3 buckets. Um, you can kind of see these, use these templates as like a starting point. So like if I just tell it I'm doing S3, then somewhere in here, there we go. Then it creates all all that code for me. So should look pretty 
similar, pretty familiar to what we were just looking at, just minus, you know, I deleted a bunch of these comments because <laughs> yeah, awesome. get them out of the way. I just want to talk about the code. But, <laughs> awesome. but yeah, man, this, this AWS toolkit is super, super useful. Um, and yeah, next time we should show off, uh, there's a really, really cool feature with Lambda that uh, I would have to look at the docs. I don't know how to do it off the top of my head, but sure. you can actually convert, if you have an existing ASP.NET core app um, with mm -hmm. one line of code, um, well, one NuGet package, then one line of code, um, you can basically inject into the middleware to say, this is now an AWS Lambda. Um, and so with one line of code, all of that existing AWS or AWS, ASP.NET core API code that you've written will instantly run on AWS Lambda. So you don't have to re-architect your app. You don't have to rewrite it as these functions. If you already have these controllers and you've already mapped everything out, yeah, um, yeah. we add in one NuGet package, we add in one line of code, and then all of a sudden our existing backend is completely serverless, which is really, really cool. And that's that's the one where I showed that off once and somebody's like, hey, how come, how come you can't do that for Azure? I was like, <laughs> I don't know. That's a really good question because this seems like a killer feature, I guess. Yeah. That's three, three oh, killer yeah. features for everybody following along at home. Uh, oh my gosh. But, but yeah, I can really, imagine really that cool would be great. Yeah, that would yeah, be great for right. a lot of folks, man. Cause again, like we, like I'm sure we all know tons of folks that are writing backends and APIs and all these types of things. And so if you already have that investment and you're telling me it's a new kit package and a line or two of code, like, I mean, that's easy, right? Because most of the upfront work has already been done, right? Anything after that is more so, I guess, again, the creating the infrastructure for me to put the thing into, but other than that, like you're already set up. Yeah, and and you know one one of the coolest things about that is well, you know, one of we'll say one of the dangers of cloud computing is uh, vendor lock in. So you know this this code that we're looking at, um, the way I wrote it is very specific to Lambda. Like I can't go run that on Azure. And if I wanted to switch clouds, well, gosh, that means I have to do all this engineering work to port that code over. Um, but if you just use ASP.NET Core and you've built these APIs already, uh, maybe they're running locally, maybe they're running in a different cloud. Well, you can just reuse all that code and you don't have to worry about necessarily that, that vendor lock-in because if for some reason, um, maybe Azure comes to you and says, hey, we'll let you use Azure for free. And you go, great, I'll move all my code over. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's just ASP.NET Core and it'll just run on any other cloud too. So you don't have to worry about necessarily getting pigeonholed into, you know, using one cloud or the other for the rest of your life, because this, yeah. is, this is just ASP.NET Core that we've, with one line of code, are able to run on serverless functions. So really, really cool. Like I said in the beginning, man, it's choice, right? Like, and we've, <laughs> we've, had, we've had the choice to go back and forth. So anything that like continues to give me a choice, like I'm all for it, right? I'm sold. I'm sold. Um, Heck yeah. But Brandon, thank you, man. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, yeah, we're definitely going to get you scheduled up and come on and do another one. And uh, yeah, for the folks that have been in here hanging out and, and watching us so far, yeah, let us know how you like the video. Let us know if there's anything in particular that you'd love to know about, like .NET and AWS or even AWS and Maui. Maybe that's something that you're interested in. Let us know in the comments and you know we'll try to get Brandon on or maybe Brandon and some of his other teammates on to come on and talk more about it. But Let's do it. That that being said, that's the end of the show, folks. Thank you all so much for watching us. This has been Inside.net. My name is Cecil Phillip, and we'll see you again next time. Bye, everyone.